So we started trying, and before long, Kathy was pregnant. Now, those of you who have had kids or are going to have kids someday in the future know that, you know, that's, that's an, an incredible moment. It's an incredible event. You know, just the, the enthusiasm builds. You're just completely taken back. It's awesome. And we were completely taken back by it ourselves. We started, you know, collecting things and getting all excited. We had a whole box full of stuff, blankets and bibs and onesies and toys and everything. Two months later, Kathy miscarried. Now, as, as quickly as the excitement built, devastation sat in just as quickly. We were completely devastated. But we knew that God loved us. We knew that God could see us through any event in our life, and so we, we took all of those emotions, we took all that disappointment and letdown, and we, we prayed and we laid that at God's feet, and we kept trying. It took a little while, but before long, Kathy was pregnant again. Now, this time... We took every precaution. You know, Kathy rested as much as she could. She wasn't allowed to lift anything or clean anything. Uh, we, 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 did, we did everything just right. In her fourth month, the doctor told us that, you know, we were in the second trimester now. We were pretty secure and that, uh, you know, we had set an appointment to find out if we were going to have a little boy or a little girl. Exciting times, right? Well, the day before our appointment, Kathy started cramping and miscarried again. Now, the devastation was, was intense the first time around, but this time, just absolute amazing devastation. You know, we were disappointed, we were, we were frustrated. You know, people have, have babies all the time, a lot of times without even trying. And here we are, good Christian people. We go to church, we read our Bibles, we pray. You know, at this point in our life, we had decided to serve God full time, and we had completed our applications for officership in the Salvation Army. And, and I think in the back of our minds, we started to think, you know, is, is this what we get for being a Christian? You know, is this what we, we deserve for trying to serve God full-time as a pastor? But still, we go before God, we pray, and I, I think those words start rattling off in the back of your heads. You know, did I not pray hard enough the first time? You know, those, those words again begin to, to rattle, and, and words like, you owe me, God. You know, I, I've given you my life. Do I not have anything to show for my faithfulness? And it was in that moment that I, I think we were suddenly struck by our motivations. We realized that there was a part of us that expected God to come through. And if he didn't, then we had every right to leave our end of the bargain as well. We knew God loved us. That wasn't the issue. We knew God was all-powerful. And that God can handle any situation that came against us. But the problem for me was when I began to see that I was serving God only for what I could get out of him. You know, God became kind of like an electricity company to me. I paid the bill. I expect electricity. Right? It was kind of like a utility. I was willing to give God my whole heart. I was willing to, to serve God as long as. He came up with his end of the expectation as long as he fulfilled his end of the bargain. In that moment of grace, I came to see my relationship with God was more contractual than it was covenantal. And as we, we listen closely to God's voice during prayer time, I think oftentimes we can hear Jesus saying, one of you will betray me. And that's when we, we realize that the covenant has been broken. And so it goes with us. You know, so often we, we serve God in contractual ways, but a contract will never do when a covenant is required. We're called to be covenantal people, bound together by mercy's cords. But if we're honest with ourselves, if we look carefully at that hand dipping that bread in that dish, it looks all too familiar because that hand belongs to us. All of us have betrayed Christ at one point in time. And all of us have been guilty of breaking the covenant of fellowship. So what are we to do? You know, did you ever notice in the scripture passage how Jesus deals with his betrayer? Get out of here. Arrest him. I want nothing to do with him. He's broken covenant with me, and he's going to pay. Isn't that what Jesus said? No. No. Jesus continued the meal. 
Jesus included Jesus, or Judas rather, and the rest of all the disciples that were sitting at that table. And he offers the bowl to all of them. Knowing full well that he was going to be betrayed, Jesus offered friendship and unity and love anyways. He doesn't turn them away. And, and Jesus does much more than that even. In the midst of their treachery and unfaithfulness, on the very night of their betrayal, he offers them a covenant again. And in, at the, the very moment of their breaking the covenant, Jesus offers them a new one. And the gift that he offers to his disciples and to all who would betray him is the gift of himself. This is my body. This is my blood. He offers bread and he shares the cup with double-crossing, betraying disciples. Friends, God knows every single one of our failures. He's aware of all the messes that we create for ourselves and all the messes that we create for other people. He knows that we've all betrayed him again and again and again. But God offers us covenant anyways. God has committed himself to every one of us in the person of Jesus Christ anyways. He stays with us. He doesn't desert us. And there's a new covenant that's made possible through his blood that provides a way for every single one of us. It's a covenant that's not established through our, our goodness or through our faithfulness. It's a covenant that's established by his grace. And the bleeding and dying man on the middle cross reminds us again and again that there's always a place for us at his table. We've all betrayed him, all of us. But there's mercy and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And because of that, he invites us to come to his table. He invites us to live as transformed people of grace. And he gives us power to live lives as redeemed people. Because if you remember, the very ones that betrayed Jesus at his most desperate time of need later went on to be martyrs for his name. You know, our world is a place of broken promises and betrayals and contracts. That's why today, you know, more than any other time in history, we need Jesus. He's the covenant maker. He's the covenant bearer. He's the covenant keeper. He's our savior and our shepherd and our friend. He'll always, always keep up his end of the bargain. He'll never fail you or forsake you. Because the kingdom of God isn't about contracts. The kingdom of God is about covenants. You know, that evening, <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples gathered around the table to share the Seder meal or the Passover meal. And there's, there's many aspects of the Seder meal that help to remind them of God's provision and God's grace and rescuing them as uh, in, in, in Egypt those many, many years ago, making them free people of God. But that evening, Jesus took two aspects in particular and he enriched them and he gave them deeper meaning. In a covenant-making moment, Mark chapter 14 tells us while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. You know, I would say this morning that Jesus extends that same covenant opportunity to us. You know, even though some of us are, or all of us rather, are prone to treat our relationship with God as contractual, even those that we're, we're so quick to abandon and betray when the going gets tough, Jesus still includes us at his table. Even in the midst of our treachery and unfaithfulness, Jesus offers us covenant. He gives the gift of himself and he offers the bread and shares the cup with double-crossing, betraying disciples. You know, this morning I want to give each of us the opportunity to once again, you know, perhaps enter that covenant for the first time or, or to come this morning and, and renew that covenant. You know, if there's, there's something that's, that's burdening your heart this morning, we need to take this opportunity to come to this place of prayer and to leave that at Jesus' throne of grace. On the, uh, the holiness table, you'll see we have uh, those portions of the Seder meal. We have the, uh, the unleavened bread or the body of Christ that was broken, and we have the, uh, it's, it's just grape juice, uh, but it reminds us of the blood that was shed. 
And it by no means is it a means to grace, but it's a means to remember. A means to remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for every one of us just to offer us covenant, just to offer us love and acceptance and friendship no matter what. So this morning, if you'd like to come to this place and, and perhaps renew that covenant today, if you'd like to come to this place and, and just remember what God has done for you, looking forward to what we're going to do for God as we exit those doors, I would invite you. I'm going to ask Tom to, uh, to play a song. And certainly you're, uh, you're more than welcome to sing along that, with that as well. But please remember, this place of, of grace is open to you this morning and this place of, of covenant as well. We don't need a, a priest to administer it or anything. You can just come as you are and, uh, and partake of the covenant that Jesus would have for us. Remember his faithfulness and be faithful in return. Let's sing together. Lord, look past my faults and into the deepest part of my spirit where I love you with all of my being. Amen. Well, we're going we're gonna to close in a, in a word of song if you would open your songbooks to song 325. Uh, but certainly the holiness table in this place is still open for you. Uh, so if you feel God leading you to that place, um, please feel open and please feel free. Um, but it's song 325 in our songbooks, a song that says, I could not do without thee, O Savior of the lost, whose precious blood redeemed me at such tremendous cost. And as we think of all that Jesus has done for us, what a tremendous cost he paid so that we could be in relationship with him. It's, uh, it's my prayer that all of us would be able to say, I could not do without thee, my Savior and my Lord. Song 325, we're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth verses together. And again, if, even during this time of song, if you'd like to come to the holiness table or even to the altar, to this place, please feel free. <laughs>